Are you someone who, when you're taking a test, if you're in college or high school or wherever, you like multiple choice or true or false, you know, is it A, B, or C? And by the way, life act, it'll, it, it's never going to be C. Uh, <laughs> or are you the person who is more likely to enjoy uh, essay questions? where you have to give a long answer and you can just kind of figure your answer out, which, no, you'd rather like, I want to know, clear, black and white, yes, no, right, wrong, A, B, C, it's never C, A or B, uh, it, sometimes it's C, just to throw you off. <laughs> As we move into the book of Hebrews, our second week here, we have a group of people that are receiving this letter that they're trying to figure out how it is that we're going to follow Jesus. How do we do this? And how do we do it well? How, does this, how do we live this out? And they're frustrated people. They're hurting people. And they don't always know what the right answer is. How is it that I connect to God? How do I live this faith journey? And they don't know, is it black or white? Is it this way or that way? And, and if, I just, if I just went back to the old way of how I did my faith, because these are Jewish people, if I just go back to the old way, to the old patterns, to the old traditions, then I know exactly the right way to do it. I know it. It is black and white. It's easy. We're going to continue going into the first chapter here. Starting in verse 1, it says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. God promised everything to his son as an inheritance. And through the son, he created the universe. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by his mighty power of his command. And when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. This shows that the Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than their names. For God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all of God's angels worship him. Regarding the angels, he said, he sends his angels like the winds, his servants like flames of fire. But to his son, he says, your throne, O God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Therefore, O God, your God has anointed you. And these are all the things that, that God says about his son, Jesus. Pouring out the oil of joy on you more than on anyone else. He also says to his son, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you will remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. They will, you will fold them up like a cloak and discard them like old clothing. But you are always the same. You will live forever. And God never said to any of the angels, Sit at the place of honor at my right hand until I stumble Humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. But to Jesus, he did say that. Therefore, angels are only servants, spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Chapter 2, verse 1. So we must listen carefully to the truth that we have now just heard. And when I, when I read this, it just gives me such a heart for people that it makes me want to walk up to people and just put my arm around them and just hug people and, and say, you know what? Jesus is just so great. And that is who we need to focus on is Jesus. And, and this is only God's opinion of who Jesus is. And as I've been reading the book of Hebrews, Hebrews, it's been causing me to face Jesus more and more in all of the glory and of all of his majesty. And at the same time ago, this is also going to be a really difficult study for me. Because it's not, it's not going to be easy, but it is going to be amazingly beneficial because I don't know of any other book in the New Testament 
that could force me to learn more about the Old Testament at the same time that I'm learning about the New Testament. And I'm not even going to be able to understand the book of Hebrews unless I continually go back to the Old Testament. And I'm grateful because I'm going to learn some really great things here. And I love that. I mean, that is the point. The point is not for me to come here and preach to you and tell you right and wrong, black and white, this is how we do Christianity. The point of me being a pastor is because God said, Kenny, I need you to be a pastor because then you're going to learn a lot and you're going to be broken and humbled. I'm like, thank you, because this is honestly, selfishly about my growth. Thank you for coming, Uh, but this is about me. (laughs) And the book of Hebrews is causing me to learn things that I I didn't know that I was going to learn. And it's forcing me to wrestle with different issues that are coming up. And there can be a lot of uh, theological confusion. Ideas, uh, theological meaning uh, when we talk about theology, theology just means our understanding of God. So there's going to be a lot of views, uh, ideas about God, not only in the world because of other religious systems that are in the world. But even among Christians and churches, there are different ideas about God, and there's some confusion because a lot of people don't understand the relationship between the Old Testament of the Bible and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the New Promise, the way that God is now dealing and relating and connecting to people and the fulfilling of His love and His promise to us. And one of the problems historically about Christianity is that many people didn't understand that there was what the connection was between the old and the new covenant. And so if I don't really know, and I'm, I'm going through my Bible, and, and I'm learning about these great things, and I mean wonderful things as I'm reading the Old Testament, and I'm going through and I'm learning, if I don't understand the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start saying, well, in, in this Old Testament, God said this. That means I have to do it exactly as he said it then, and I'm gonna, i got to do it, and this is how I'm supposed to live. instead of going, but how does that balance out with the New Testament? Because it's not about getting the right answer, whether it's true or false, A, B, or C. It's about how do I live connecting to God, and how is God connecting to me, and how is God speaking to us? And and I'm starting to understand more about the Holy Spirit and the Old Testament. And it's clear that the Holy Spirit did come upon people, even in the Old Testament. And and people prayed for that. David specifically prayed that the Holy Spirit would not be taken from him. And in the New Testament, the relationship with the Holy Spirit and believers, it becomes completely different. And and it's illustrated beautifully in John chapter uh, 14. It says, one day Jesus was with his disciples and he gave them this promise telling them that you know the holy spirit is going to come and they might have been looking at him a little bit funny like well we already know the holy spirit we believe in the holy spirit and he's with us now and it says here it says he is the holy spirit who leads into all truth the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him but you know him because he lives in you now and later will be in you You already know him because he's with you, but not just with you anymore. After I go, he's going to come into you. The relationship with the Holy Spirit between the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's different. Something is changing. Something is happening. The Holy Spirit doesn't just come upon people. Now he's inside of you, and he needs to take control of you. And that starts to bring up more questions in my mind. And we'll get into that. And we're going to talk about the confusion that, with the laws that God gave in the Old Testament and people bringing them into the New Covenant. And, and the people who had this letter written to them, they've been having a hard time breaking away from the rituals and the traditions that they grew up with, going, this is how we worship God. This is how we love God. This is how we honor God. And we have all these great external trappings that they thought... We have to have them and we have to do them if we're going to have a healthy relationship with God so that God loves us, God knows that we believe in him. And the author of Hebrews is going to say over and over and over again, get it inside of you. It's not just what you do. It's not building, uh, it's not the sanctuary and building a temple and a place for God. Now it is inside of your heart. 
In the Old Testament, the Jews believed that the sanctuary, it was a physical structure, that it was a temple where the presence of God would show up and dwell inside of. And that's how people understood this is how God works. We go to the temple because that is where God lives. That is where the presence of God is going to be manifested. And I want to go to where God is. But in the new way of living, he no longer lives in a house that's been built with stone and built by the hands of men and women. But now, you and I, we are now the temples of the fullness of God that who lives inside of us. You and I are where God lives. And that was a new idea. It was a new covenant. It's a, it's a better way. It is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the laws were written on stone tablets. But in the New Testament, the laws were written directly onto our hearts. And Hebrews is going to talk about many of the changes that were done. And they were, they were done away with even when Jesus went and sat at the right hand of the Father. And this is going to be a book that's going to bring about some deep understanding of God, but more than a study of deep truth and theology of who God is, it's going to be a study about people who are struggling with their faith. And that's why I've fallen in love with it. People just like you, just like me, and, and, and we struggle at times, especially when we are in the pressing and we're in the crushing because to get to the new wine, there's, got to, there's, there's this pressing and these, these people are going through the pressing, and I think they're going to be really good friends of ours. The people that are receiving this letter, they're Jewish people, and they were living at a time when it was not popular to be a Jew. The church was a little bit unique in the fact that the church was, uh, they had three distinct uh, kinds of people that were attending this church uh, and they were living at a day and a time and a year that it was not even popular to be a Jew. This church is a little bit unique in the fact that it is distinctly a Hebrew church, and it was written at about 70 A.D., and it was a time in history where Jews were not responding to the gospel anymore. This wasn't where Jews were converting. This wasn't, you know, the missionaries, the apostles, they'd already gone to the Gentile world because the Gentiles, the people who were not raised with the Jewish history, I mean, they're like, yes, we love this. We love the idea of Jesus. This is bringing freedom and healing and release, and I'm connecting to the living God. And people who did not ever grow up with the Hebrew faith across the world were exploding going, yes, we've been waiting for this. This is what we are wanting. But the Jews, they're like, well, I mean, that happened a while ago. And that's not something we ever wanted back then. Why do I still want it now? They were not responding in large groups. Because it started to look like, well, this is really a Gentile religion, meaning a, a religion that the Jews, we don't want. Anyone but the Jews. And that made Jews kind of want to dig in their heels even more. But this church is Jewish, meaning these are people who have given their hearts to Jesus. There's not a Gentile in it. And that was creating some problems in this church. Because in the social climate that they were living in, they're Jews living in a day when it's not even safe to be a Jew. Because the Roman emperor, Titus uh, Vespanius, he had committed himself to the annihilation of the Jews. He had gained his fame as this military commander, so when he came into power after Nero, he decided to send his full force to, to crush any Jewish rebellion that was going on. I mean, we like to think maybe Jews were passive. They were very aggressive, trying to retake Israel. They were trying to, you know, reclaim their, their land. And he's like, no, we're going to take them all out. We just need to crush everyone. They've got a little bit too much arrogance. We're going to take them down. So three days before Passover was to happen, when the largest crowds of Jewish believers would be in Jerusalem, he sent his armies into Jerusalem. He destroyed the temple that they were worshiping because the Jews believed that God worshiped there. So they destroyed the temple. He leveled it. It is estimated that up to a million and a hundred thousand Jews were actually killed during this siege. Males 17 years or older, they were either put into hard labor camps or made uh, to become gladiators to be killed and slaughtered in other ways. Women and children were sold into slavery and the Jews were dispersed all over the Roman Empire wherever they could sell them. 
They were disbanded as a nation, and they did not become a nation again until 1948 in the month of May. Because of this particular incident, this is a historical, grounded, and rooted incident. And there are people in this church who grew up never, they never saw Jesus, they had never met Jesus, they are now second and third generation Jewish believers, they have been evangelized and they learned about Jesus from the apostles and the disciples who shared about Jesus and told them about Jesus, but these people in this church, they did not know Jesus, this isn't their, their relationship, they had never had the benefit of seeing Jesus or hearing him speak, they never saw the miracles. They only heard it second and third hand from others who had heard and seen Jesus. Possibly, we believe that this church is even in Italy, even closer to the center of the Roman Empire. But not only were these Jews, and that wasn't a very popular thing to be a Jew at the time, they were also Jewish believers, believers that had given their heart to Jesus. And because they're Jewish believers, they were now branded by the Jews, so they were hated by everyone already, so you would think that they would want to kind of find some solace and, and, and consolation by let's all of us Jewish believers, you know, who are Jewish of, of heritage and faith, let's band together. But the problem is the Jews who did not accept Jesus, they were saying, no, you guys, you little messianic people, messianic Jews, you people who believe in Jesus, we don't like you either. Because you're giving up the Jewish faith. You're following after Jesus, and we don't like you either. So now they're, they're even more isolated, more lonely, more cut off. Because you're now following this Nazarene who is from Galilee. I mean, what a waste of your life. And the pressure was on them from their family and friends. Come back to the synagogue. Come back to the real faith. Come, come back to the law, because the law will give you a sense of security. And there were three groups of people that were in this church, and we talked a little bit about this last week. But if we're ever going to really understand the book of Hebrews, we have to hear this over and over. The first group were the group of Hebrew believers, people who completely put their heart and their trust in Jesus. And they were believers. They were really discouraged, and they were struggling in their faith. And the weight of being pulled to go back to becoming full Jews was on them, and they were in danger of it. And some of them were actually leaving the traditions of the Christianity and their faith to go back to the law and the ceremonies. And they were bringing some of their Old Testament traditions and customs and ceremonies into Christianity, saying maybe we can find ways to blend it. And the joy was kind of just being snuffed out of them. And into these believers, the writer of the book of Hebrews says this, Believer, you who believe in Jesus, just come on, hold on, hold on, don't give up, don't give up no matter what, because Jesus is a better way. Jesus is life, the name of Jesus. I just want to give you a big hug. We can do this. I want to embrace you. And then you had the second group of people in the church, people who believed, well, I believe in my head that, that he is the Messiah, that Jesus is the one that we've been waiting for. He's the one that we've studied in the scriptures. I know that he is the one that Isaiah prophesied and pointed to. They acknowledge that Jesus was the Messiah, But they haven't come to a place in their life where they committed their hearts and their lives saying, okay, but I'm going to trust in him and and I'm going to give my heart to Jesus as my Savior and my God. I'm going to give my life. They knew the theology. They knew the right answers. But they said, "Ah, I I don't know that I want it to change me. I know Jesus is God, but I don't want the pressing I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really get this new, new fire or the new wine. I just, I, I just believe it, but I don't really want to do anything with it. I just want to go home and go do what I want to do on Sunday afternoon, and I want to spend the week how I want to spend the week, but I'll be back at church next Sunday. I don't know that I want to really follow I don't know what you really created me for. I don't even know what to lean into. And, and they really weren't much different than many people today. And, and I don't know many of your hearts in this room. And 
Uh, but I know that in a church even this size that there are going to be people that fit that category. They know the right answers. They will argue the right answers. They, they want to know the right theology. What is true? What is not? What do I need to know? What is the basic minimum that I have to have? But I don't know how or I don't want to really give my heart to Jesus. The message of the book of Hebrews is this. Come all the way in. Come all the way in. Don't stay on the outside anymore. It is so good. The water is great. Dive in. Just go head first. No more just putting your toe in the water. And the book of Hebrews is going to confront us over and over with this. The third group are simply those that don't even believe. They, they didn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're not really following the way of Jesus. They're coming with family or friends. And the book of Hebrews shares this over and over again about who Jesus is. Jesus is, in fact, exactly who he says he is. So I, I kind of want you to visit this church with me. I've had to do this this week. It, it helps me where I kind of, I, I need to visualize. It helps me enter into the reality instead of just being a piece of history. I've got to like, how do I get into this small church? So I've been, I've been kind of viewing a, a small village in Italy where there's these stone houses that are like two stories and, and you've got this group of Jewish believers that are gathering on a Sunday morning. Family and friends and they're walking these cobblestone roads through the village where they're going to meet, and, and they meet. And when they, they see each other, they knock on the door, and the door opens, and there's hugs, and they're hugging each other. They're welcoming. They're sharing the food that they brought. And, and when you go in, you're like, there's something special about this. There's something special about this group of believers as they're getting together. There's a brightness in their eyes. And as you move into the service, one of the things that you start to notice is, is there's something different about this church service than maybe a different one that I had been going to because when these people are together, oh, there's just, I feel like I can take a deep breath. Have you ever felt that? It's like I just feel like there's something here, like I can almost taste the Holy Spirit moving, like the presence of God is, is and I could touch the walls and it's like I can feel like it, it's just dripping off and their hearts were full and they're praising God from their hearts. It's not just something they're singing. It's not a ritual. It's not something we have to do. It's because I want to do it because somehow my heart is connected to the living God and I, I want to, it just comes, it comes out of me and, there, and at the same time, and I don't even know if you guys felt it this morning, but it, I, I couldn't even sing from a couple of those songs. Just there was like this this weight on me, and I just I felt it even, even this morning, like there's a there's a weight on my heart or in on my body and, and a heaviness. When I feel the presence of God, I feel like I like like there's a thorn, you know, like a blackberry thorn, not a small one, but like a big one, and it's like it slides right into my chest. I don't know how you guys feel, if you ever feel the presence of God, where it doesn't kill me, but I'm just taking these little short breaths, and I can't even sing anymore. I don't know if that happened, how, how your body responds, but when that's one of the ways that I know. I'm like, oh, God, you're here because I can barely breathe. And there's something different that comes on me when I'm in the presence of God. And it's, sometimes it's hard for me to sing because of that. And I, and I feel like when I'm imagining this first century church where these people are just, some of them are crying because their body doesn't know what else to do other than, God, you're so beautiful and you're doing something, and you're healing me. And even though it feels like there's a pressing, I know there's something good happening. And I start to get this impression very quickly that as I'm among these other believers, that there's a pain in their hearts, and, and there's something very much that is hurting, and, and there's even something discouraged. And I go, okay, why are they discouraged? And one of the reasons is, is they were searching the scriptures. And there are these oppressed, mocked, insulted, put down people, and they've been looking for the Messiah for hundreds and hundreds of years as a, as a people. And then this one man who, who came from Galilee, who had these signs and wonders, he died and rose again. He came, and, and they believed all of that. 
And one of the messages that Jesus gave that kept ringing in their ears and they would use it to encourage each other with all the time, over and over, was this, I am coming back again. And, and when Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave that message to his followers and the apostles and the disciples were going out and telling everyone, he is going to return, he's going to come again. And they shared the message of Jesus and they went from town to town to town and all over the world and the message came again to these people and they would shout it, I'm coming again. And, and the weight of this world that was pressing down on them, the loss of their lives, it was a very real threat for these people. Their homes and their temple, the city was all about to be destroyed. But that what they would say to each other, to encourage each other, keep your eye on Jesus, is I'm going to return, so keep your eye on Jesus. He's coming back. He's coming again. And, and, I, and I know I've said it, and I believe it. And he's going to release us from bondage. And he's going to save us from this political climate that we live in. He's going to save us from wars and destruction. And from all the things that we see around us. And it's like everything feels like it could be going sideways. But, but I know that he's going to come again. And he's going to release us from this bondage. He's going to release us from this pain. He is going to get the glory. And they've been saying this for years though. And, and it wasn't happening. I mean, I mean, we say it. We say it today. Hasn't happened in their lifetime. It hasn't happened in our lifetime yet. And the brightness of their eyes of hope was starting for many of them to fade. And, and now their passion and their zeal and they're wondering, are we just being disillusioned? Because we had been really confident. I was so sure of my faith when I first came to Jesus. It felt so real. I was so sure. I knew it was Jesus. I knew, I knew, I knew. Because God, you did something. And I memorized the words of the prophets. And it had gotten into my heart. But you haven't come back yet. You haven't returned. He hasn't come and some of the people in this church, in this village, starting to say, you know what, I, I think I'm just going to, just for now, just for a little bit, I just want to go back. I just want to go back. I'd, I can't handle it anymore. I feel, I feel scared. So next Sabbath, I'm, I'm going to go back to the temple. Living by faith in Christ... <laughs> Today it just feels too much. Maybe, maybe tomorrow I'll have a little bit more courage. I'm just going to go back. I don't know if any of you have felt that. Whether through a physical tragedy, uh, a sort of pain, a loss, an economic devastation where your plans and your hopes, they just fell. Some sort of hurt and disillusionment. And the only word you can, can describe it would, would be, uh, I'm losing hope. Because <laughs> I, I gave myself to that. And I knew the promises, I memorized them, I claimed them, I believed them. I, <laughs> uh, and now it seems like God is just letting me down. I'm going to go back. And, and you might be able to tell me, well, I mean, I felt like that, Kenny. I felt like going back, but, but I'm not because... I mean, there's nothing to go back to. Uh, I don't have another religious system to go back to. I didn't, I didn't come out of a different religious system that, might, that I might be able to go back to. And, and the Jews, I mean, they had this religious system that they could go back to. They had their families that, that had a different system, a system of law, and it was very safe. If I just do the right thing, if I just do it and say it the right way, because this new way, it feels a little bit more uncertain. It's a little bit more scary, this Christianity thing, and, and the, this following the way of Jesus thing. And I've never actually said the words myself like that, but, but I have grown up in a church. I grew up in church, church just like this. And I knew, I know some, some people, even in the last year, where they've hit some things and... You know, it's kind of like, well, 
the pandemic should have shaken us all, but some people, uh, it's like, ah, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's not convenient, obviously, but, but it's only been in the last year that I know some people, it's like, oh, this, now this hurt. And this is shaking me up, and I, now I feel disillusioned. Where, where now there's something's going on in my marriage, or something's going on in my, with my kids. Or maybe it's your economic situation, and, and it feels like God isn't going to come through. And I don't know if anyone else knows that feeling. I know that feeling. I'm going back. I'm going to go back to mediocrity. I'm, I'm going to... I felt like I was challenged to grow or to... I don't know. I don't know what you're doing, God, but I'm just hurting. And I, I got to a place where I've got so much pain and it would just be easy for me to go back or to not care, to go back to not loving, to not confessing, to not being honest about those things that are raging in my heart. And maybe some of you are sitting in this room and you've realized for the first time, oh, <laughs> I did go back and I didn't even know it. I actually went back. I've already gone back. because I, I, As I look back over the last year or so, maybe I realize... Oh yeah, I'm not confessing. I'm not, I'm not talking to God like I used to. I, I, I'm not bringing my heart to Jesus. It'd be easy to go back to not forgiving. It'd be easy for me to go back to bitterness. And maybe you didn't come out of a different religious system and, and or maybe you did come out of a different religious system and, and then you met Jesus but somewhere along the way you got discouraged and you thought, I'm, I'm just going to go back. Because this way of following Jesus feels too hard. And if you hear how the little church felt, I mean, what do you say to people like that when you hear this little church or if you hear that from people in our church, if your friends say that, if your family say what are you, what are we supposed to, I mean, like, how do we, what's the right thing to say? And then I feel like, well, I'm supposed to have the right answers. And this is where I would slide that into you right now. Here's my three-point sermon, and here's what to say to people like that. But the reality is I don't know. Because um, sometimes what a lot of pastors do is, is okay, I'm going to call up my boss. Uh, I'll go to my district office. I'm going to call them and say, hey, you know, we really need some help because we've got some struggle in our church. I need some ideas. Um, and there's this church over in Longview. They seem to be doing something really good because they're growing. Man, what are they doing? Or, or there's this church in Portland. Man, they're exploding. Okay, okay, how about I go, I'm going to be gone next week. I'm going to go visit them, and I'm going to go see what they're doing. I want to see what ministries they have. What are they doing right? Because obviously we're doing something wrong. They're doing something right. There's this church in Vancouver. It's huge. They're doing something right. We're not. We're not. We're not. Okay, uh, maybe if we want to be successful, let's copy what it is that they're doing well, that, that old, let's try that. Uh, so we call, I, you know, I call up my superintendent. I call, up, I call them up, and they tell us, well, this one church over, over in this, you know, Portland or over in Vancouver, what they got is this great program. What they do is they give out gold stars and goldfish. And, and they give it away. And, and everything's worked really well for them. And everything turned out great. Look, look at all the people that are coming to that church. You should do that. This other church in this other city, I mean, they've got these great things. It's this wonderful program. Everything's worked out. It's a success. Everyone, if you do this, goldfish and gold stars, everything's going to be great. And we're talking the ones you eat, not the ones that you put in a jar, because they just die. And that's just sad. And so, uh, you know, I just go, ah, that's how we get past this confusion and doubt is goldfish and gold stars. <laughs> I'm really glad the author of the book of Hebrews here didn't tell us any of that gobbledygook because that would have been horrid. I don't always know what to say when people feel like that. I don't even always know what to do when I feel like that. But I am really glad that by the inspiration of God himself, the author of the book of Hebrews, knew exactly what to say. 
He came to these people who are feeling this way. He took them by the hand. He wrapped his arms around them and he gave them a big hug and basically said, my friends, God has already talked and he's spoken. Don't go back. Don't go back. We just need to see more of Jesus. The only thing I know is, and this is all I really know, is we just need to see more of Jesus. So how do I help you to see more? And it's not enough just to hear God speak to us. That, that's only half of the equation. The other half is I, I need you to notice how you respond and what you do or do not do when God speaks. I mean, I love it when God talks to us. But what do you do when God talks to you? Well, that's not what I want to hear. I'm going to wait for a better message. I'm going to wait for something I want to hear. God says, well, I think you should do this, or do, don't do that, or nah, I don't like that answer. Hearing God is only part of it. <laughs> Allowing God to speak and, and putting ourselves in a position to hear, that is only half of it. The other half is, what do you do when you hear God speak? That's what oftentimes I get to help people with when we do spiritual direction together. We'll be listening and we'll be praying or, or doing whatever we need to do as we're having, kind of trying to hear the voice of God and then, and then I'll say, what do you think you're hearing? What do you sense God doing in your heart or life? And they're like, oh, I don't want to tell you. <laughs> okay. And they're like, oh, but I got to do it. All right. I feel like God is saying this. And then I go, okay, but what are you going to do with that? Well, now that I said it out loud. <laughs> and sometimes people will be real honest. If I didn't tell you, I wouldn't have to do it. <laughs> but now that you know, <laughs> I have to do the right thing. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, God spoke many times in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. We start right there. Start with what you know. And what you know has been spoken. God spoke to you through the prophets, and he spoke to you through the angels. He has spoken to you through visions and through the scriptures. And that is the old way. But you need to know something else, that he is also doing something different. Everything up to this point had not been complete when this was written. You're always looking for something else. You're always looking for something better. You're always looking for something that would fulfill the very promises that God was giving. It had been revealed to Noah to which son the Messiah would come through. Through Abraham it was revealed to which nation the Messiah would come from. To Jacob, which tribe, to David and Isaiah, which family it would come through. To Micah, it was told what town, to Daniel, the time. And it happened on and on and on. And no one, none of these prophets, had a complete full answer to know when the Messiah was going to come or who it was. But they're always looking. More information. More information. It came in these little bits and pieces, little scraps of paper, little puzzle pieces we're trying to figure out in the Old Testament who he is and when he is coming and where he's going to come from. And, and then you go to the scripture of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and they all start to build on top of each other. But none of them, none of the books of the Old Testament gave all of the information that was needed. God has spoken, and you know it. You also know it wasn't a complete picture. Verse 2, and now in these final days... It's about the final days. It is, and it's not talking the end of time here. He's meaning the days of fulfillment. When it finally happened, when it has all come together, all of the promises that you've been looking for your entire life in these final days, the promises have come together. They're not fragmented anymore. This day is now the day of fulfillment. We're living in the day of fulfillment. He has spoken to us through his son. And when it says he that he has spoken, it means something. When it talks about God speaking through the prophets and, and many ancestors, it's always in the past tense. But now he has done it. This is what God has done. And when it says he has spoken to us through his son, there is a finality to it. 
Finally, he has spoken to us through Jesus. It is now complete. He has now revealed it. There is no more to know. There's nothing else hidden. There are no more scraps of paper to be found. There's no more little puzzle pieces that we have to have to try and put them. There's nothing hiding in the creases of the couch. The waiting is over. And I want to tell you about what we know for sure. God has spoken. And now I want you, uh, I want to talk to you about the things that, that you're still struggling with and the things that you're still doubting, and that is Jesus. In the Old Testament, it was just these pieces and these fragments, just a, a hint. It was incomplete. The promise had not been fulfilled. But now God has finally spoken through Jesus. The culmination. There is no more. But, but we can't just leave it there. As we get ready to go to the communion table today, I want to tell you a little bit about Jesus. Jesus. That's what I, I love to do. I want to encourage us, those who are discouraged and want to go back, those who are discouraged and they just want to stop, those who are sitting on the fence, I want you to come in all the way. And those who are not yet convinced that he is the Son of God, he is. Hebrews 1 verse 2. And now in these final days he has spoken. He has taken all the fragments and he is now speaking fully and complete to us through his son. And I want to tell you about him. God promises everything to the son as an inheritance and through the son he created the universe. Colossians 1.16 For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether stones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. They were created, I love that, for him. That one I had to pause on. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. God promised to Jesus everything as an inheritance. He is the heir of all things, and I am a child of God. That means that I am an heir also. We are heirs, and everything that is his is also mine. And if he is the heir of all things, and he is the creator of all things, and it's through him that the world was made, he can make something out of nothing. I don't know if you ever feel like where well, your tank is just empty, and there's just nothing left. There's nothing left in my marriage. There's nothing left in my job. There's nothing left in my family. There's nothing left in me. He is the one who has the ability to make something out of nothing. So hang on and don't go back. He is the heir of all things. He is the creator of all things. He is the one who upholds all things. He is the sustainer. Hebrews 1.3 The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. He is the one that holds everything together. He is the one who holds together everything until we can see the light. So hang in there. Don't go back. Don't go back to pulling in the law. Don't slow down. Keep running the race. And he will sustain you. He will hold you together and you keep on believing. He is the forgiver of all things. Hebrews 1.3 when he had cleansed us from our sins, he sat down at the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God of heaven. And you know what the significance is of sitting down? This was, this was great. To, to worship Jesus this morning, we need to know this one. Hebrews 10, 11. Day after day, every priest stands to perform his religious duties. And this is coming from the Old Testament idea, understanding of how God dealt with people. And this is how it happened. Every day the priest would stand again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take fully away sin. But when the priest Jesus had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, when he was done, he didn't stand anymore. Hebrews 1.3, he sat down at the right hand of God. It means it's done. In the Old Testament temple, there wasn't even a place for a priest to sit. There was nowhere for them to sit down because the work was never going to be done. There are believers who continually walk around and they're nervous, they're tense, they're feeling like, I haven't been forgiven. I haven't done it right. Uh, God, I haven't really come to you for whatever reason. I don't even fully feel accepted. I don't fully feel loved. 
I've never done, I've not done enough for you, God. I need to do, I need to do more. Maybe, maybe I'll have this feeling of love and acceptance if I just do more. And when we do that, one of the things that is the problem is we're rejecting the love of God. He's like, that's not how it works. I created you out of a desire to be with you, to love you, to embrace you. God's desire is to wrap his arms around us because he created us because of his deep love for us. He sat down, it is done, and we get to sit down with him. He is the forgiver of all things. And if you put your trust in him, what an amazing feeling when that weight comes off of my heart, off of my soul. And I just say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the things I did. I wish I had the courage to trust you and to put my love back in you. Give me the courage today. And that becomes my prayer over and over and over. God, give me the courage today because every day is a new day and every day I seem to want to run back sometimes. God, today give me the courage to lean into you, to trust you today. But this verse also tells me that he is the king of kings and he sat down at the right hand of the Father, the right hand of God, and it tells me that he is the God of all gods and he is the radiance of God's glory. And I love that because it's like the rays shooting out of the sun. Verse 4, this shows that the sun is far greater than the angels, just as the name God gave him is greater than any name. And because of all of this, chapter 2, verse 1, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard about Jesus and the same Jesus, 2,000 years ago, he gathered around a table with 12 of his disciples and he lifted the cup that represented his blood and he took the bread that represented his body and he gave it to his disciples, to his followers, and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And that's why we still do it today. It's because we, we need to see more of Jesus and so we keep coming to the communion table where I say, God, less of me, more of you. So this morning, we've got two more songs that are going to play on a video, but I'm also going to stand up here, and if anyone at any point would like me to serve them communion, uh, I'm going to do that. I will have the juice and just the cup and the bread. You're welcome. Uh, typically, the way it works best is... You walk down this aisle and maybe back that one. Uh, do like a little circle. But also be careful because there's a cable right here and I don't want you to trip because that would be bad. But I'm going to pray and then we are going to open this up for communion and uh, two more songs. So Father, fill us this morning. Give us more eyes to see you, to give us a greater vision of who you are, a greater uh, sense of awareness of your beauty and your majesty, because nothing can change our heart more than if we just see you. To remember even the things that you've done in our hearts and lives and how, God, you have even taken nothing and you built something. You created something out of nothing in my heart and out of, out of my life. And so, God, I worship you this morning.